Hello everyone, welcome to Case by Case. This is a podcast brought to you by Callum Chain and Luke Zadkovich from Zyla Floyd Zadkovich. How are you today, Callum? I'm very good. I'm glad that we're back on track with podcast, the second, second one of after our little hiatus, so keeping it going. And this is an interesting one, very, a very interesting one for our shipping and commodities clients and listeners, which goes into a few issues that we've seen play out a number of times around LOIs and obtaining security in support of a London arbitration. Yeah, yeah, back to back, Thursday after Thursday. It's good to get back into the groove, huh? Exactly, it is. Uh, yeah, so we've got an a, a English decision that we're discussing today from the commercial court. And if I can say this from one of our, or at least one of my favorite justices to read, and I think we've made this comment about Mr. Justice Foxton before, that I find his judgments very, you know, on point, succinct, well laid out, structured. And this this is uh, is another example of that. This is the case of the Aquavita International and Indigro, a decision from April 2022. And yeah, I, I thought it, it was good. It was a good one to kind of take us through when, you know, the, the limits of an anti-suit injunction, when local proceedings taken outside of the agreed forum uh, may impinge upon the arbitration agreement uh, in, the, in the underlying contract. And it's a fascinating one. I, I think it, it's not a very long judgment, but it really gets into the, the nub of the, the key issues to consider. Yeah. And the, there's, there's always a tension with anti-suit injunctions in the maritime context where we have so many foreign proceedings in support of usually London arbitration. And this is an interesting case because it shows you that crossover point from where, say, a vessel arrest, which everyone knows is not, is, is not going to be in breach of an anti-suit, where, where your local action against, you know, to do something to the, to the physical involved, in this case, to do something with the cargo involved in the dispute, where that local action crosses over from being something which is in support of London proceedings, in which case it's not in breach of an anti-suit, to being something which cuts across the uh, London proceedings, in which case it is a breach of the anti-suit. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought from the first few lines of this, that this was going to be one of those classic cases of local receiver in Brazil, just ignoring the incorporation of a charter party arbitration agreement in a bill and, and just storming ahead. But it, it's a, it's a little more nuanced than that. It is. And, and really examining the, the nature of the local proceedings that were brought here. And so you had a cargo from China to, to Brazil. It was a, a cargo of ammonium sulfate. And there were a couple of discharge ports. Some of the cargo was discharged at the first discharge port, and then more cargo was due to be discharged at the second discharge port in Brazil. Uh, this anti-suit injunction was brought in England, I think at, almost to the end of the discharge of the first, the, at, at the end of the discharge of the first port. The judge, uh, Mr. Justice Fraser, on hearing the first application, I said it was too late in respect of that discharge at the first port. Most of it had already been discharged, but then decided the question in respect of the the rest of the cargo that would be discharged at a later port in in Brazil. And the injunction was then returned, having put in place, and was heard before Mr. Justice Foxton, and that was really the that's the decision that we're looking at today. And what the local receiver, Indigro, had obtained in Brazil was a, a discharge order of sorts where it was characterized by them, by the, the receivers, the respondent here in, in, the, um, in the English action, as an interim step that was taken as security or to secure their position. I had like, I think the, the court ultimately, he was skeptical of, of that and how it was put, but the, the main argument that receivers were making in this proceeding, and we'll get into the, the ins and outs of it, but just at a high level was that they had brought security proceedings in Brazil to preserve the position and the applicant in England, the owners of the ship were saying, well, no, this went beyond pure security proceedings in support of the London arbitration. It sought to take things further than that. And there are a number of features of the local order that was obtained in Brazil 
that suggested or that showed that it went beyond pure security proceedings. Yeah, and I, and there are a couple of points there which which I thought are kind of worth just noting noting off before we get into them. The first, well, actually, maybe just to go into a little more detail on the on the background, mm. you had the owners of the ship. The ship was the Aquavita Eternity, and owners had chartered had chartered the ship out to charterers Indigro. The shipper for this cargo was a company called Yantai, and the receiver was Indigro. So the charterers were were both the charterers and the receivers with a shipper in the middle, and the shipper hadn't been paid by the charterer receivers for the cargo. So they, so the, the shipper was then saying to owners, do not release this, don't, don't discharge this cargo to the receivers. They haven't paid us. And, and the charterers were saying to owners, well, we can, you, we, we can, we can demand discharge because among other things, there's one of the provisions we see a lot of in the charter party saying that a discharge was to take place against an LOI. And that, that was the issue in the case was that you, you had owners saying, well, we're going to, we're going to end up exposing ourselves to a claim because we're going to be discharging a cargo against these, against these shippers instructions to somebody who's, who's not paid for it. And somewhere, you know, somehow that's going to blow back on us. And just, yeah, going on. No, I was just saying, yeah, it's one of these classic, you know, dispute under the sale contract scenarios, which then pulls in the ship owner and the ship owner finds themselves between a rock and a hard place. Also where they've agreed in the charter party to deliver without presentation of bills of lading against an LOI. And it's really that underlying issue that's kind of playing out here, isn't it? And we see that so often. You have a, a party who has to discharge against an LOI and in, an, in a kind of ideal world where everybody has the kind of covenant strength to back up their LOI, that's not really a problem because you do have that indemnity and you can chase the indemnity. But in reality, the LOI is only as strong as the person giving it. So it does introduce this layer of risk where suddenly you're, you know, the strength of the, of the counterparty giving the LOI becomes very important if you're agreeing to discharge against an LOI rather than against presentation of original bills. Yeah. And it, it, we've had to, look, we're straying as we tend to do, but we've had to look at a number of these cases. And when you're in that position as a ship owner and you're presented with the facts as they're arising, do they actually fall within the four corners of that LOI? Or, or, or are you dealing with a, a situation that was not contemplated by the LOI? That, you know, is the LOI for delivery without presentation of bills intended to cover a situation where there's a true dispute between the, the cargo interests, buyer and, yeah, sell, and seller? Or is it just merely to deal with a scenario where the bills are late because the courier are taking their time? Exactly. Or they're held by a financing bank or yeah. there's some other practical reason why they can't be discharged. And I wondered there whether there's something to be said for, you know, including that in, in the, in the wording in charge parties where people are agreeing to discharge against an LOI to include some caveat that you're agreeing to discharge against an LOI provided that there's no, you know, the owner, owners don't have reasonable cause to believe that the, the discharge would be unlawful. You know, mm. There'd be better wording than that, of course, but that, that, that type of wording would at yeah. least make it clear. I've thought that for a while. I thought that for a while that the wording that's found its way into charter parties where owners are agreeing in advance to deliver without presentation of bills could be tightened, make it clearer um, as to what are the types of circumstances that this is intending to deal with. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, so the other point that, that jumped out just as a, as a, as a quick one to flag is, is that the, as, as you said earlier, Luke, the, the. At first instance, or when, when this was first raised, kind of without, without proper notice, as is often the case for an anti-suit injunction or any injunction, the, the judge, Mr. Justice Fraser, declined to give an order in respect to the cargo that had already been discharged. And there's just a, a, a pretty simple and elementary point there, which is that the court's not going to grant you injunctive relief if that is, you know, if, if it would be acting in vain in doing so. So, yeah. you know, this, the, it, it won't give you the period victory of saying, you, you know, they've done something wrong. They'll just say, no, we can't, we're not going to give you an order in respect of a cargo that's already been discharged. Yeah. We've seen that in the context of freezing, freezing injunctions exactly. where a client might come to us and say, look, we want a freezer. We want to lock down all the assets and we need to have some basis upon which we're applying to the English court to say, preserve the status quo, right? A freezer is not a, a security application. It's a preservation of assets to make sure they're not dissipated. If the assets have already been dissipated, if they're gone and we can't point to any others, then as you say, it's kind of a moot point. Uh, the, the horse has bolted, so to exactly. speak. It's the, it's the classic tension in a freezer where 
you have to show that they're trying to dissipate, but they've not been quite successful yet in getting rid of all their assets. Exactly, exactly. So here, the the main, the main, well, a, a few main issues, but just to kind of set the premise of what this judgment was about from a legal perspective, there was really no dispute between the parties as to what were the principles in that the court were applying to determine whether to grant an anti-suit injunction. And, and in brief, there were four, that there are four key principles, albeit one of, only one of those was really before the court and, and in dispute here. The first one to note is that the court has the power to grant an injunction to rest, restrain proceedings that are in breach of an arbitration agreement. And that's even if the arbitra- arbitration proceedings have not yet been commenced. So they could be in prospect and not just on foot. The second is that the applicant, so the party seeking the anti-suit injunction, must show a high probability of success that the pursuit of the foreign proceedings involves a breach of the arbitration agreement. So it's this high probability of success test. And that was the key principle in dispute in this case, which we'll get into in a moment. The third principle is that if the applicant does make out that case, so it does show a high probability of success, it is then for the respondent to show a strong reason why relief should not be granted. And then the fourth point is that it must be just and convenient for an anti-suit injunction to be granted. And as I say, it's really the second of those, a high probability of success test that was in play here. Yeah. And I, and what I what I thought was um, was interesting about this case is it's actually the first case, and the judge mentions this. is It's the first authority where where there is a an application the the application which the appellant says is in breach of the arbitration agreement. So the foreign application is for interim relief, but not concerned with obtaining security. So it's the first time the court has dealt with an anti suit case where. There's a foreign application, which somebody says is in breach of an anti-suit, and that foreign application is for interim relief, but not for interim relief to obtain security. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's an odd one, isn't it? <laughs> mm. Because it is. most of the cases are uh, security type act, act applications that have been brought elsewhere, and how do they dovetail with the, the London arbitration? Exactly. And, and, you know, those cases we see all the time, and, and I think people in the, particularly in the kind of shipping and commodities space would, would, would not think for a second that going after, you know, a vessel arrest or a bunker arrest or some kind of order over cargo, like exercising a lien is somehow in breach of a, of a London arbitration agreement. You know, that, that's such a, such a, such a tried and tested part of, of maritime and commodities arbitration that it's, it's not it's not really in doubt. And the judge does give a few, a few authorities on that, you know, just to say, this is something which is very well settled, but here we're in that gray area where, okay, they're doing something to kind of the, you know, the application in Brazil was to, was to, was to preserve the cargo in a, in a sense, you know, after a fashion, they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, make sure the cargo goes to the right person in Brazil. But really what they're doing is undermining the entirety of the London arbitration agreement, because the London arbitration would be about who was entitled to receive that cargo. Yeah, well, the, the fundamental problem for me with the underlying order in, in Brazil was that it required delivery to the alleged receivers rather than discharge into a warehouse ashore under the owner's control. So it wasn't really preserving the, the position and saying, let's put this into a bonded warehouse while a dispute is worked out in London. It was giving delivery to the alleged receivers, the local receivers. Now, it may have still been on some interim basis, but they had, they would have had, in the absence of an anti-suit, the, the cargo it would have been theirs. Um, so so, so but the, the, the court gets into analyzing the content of the local court decision. And this was an area that I, I, I must admit, I wasn't aware, or I, it's not that I wasn't aware of it, but I, I wasn't aware of these factors, these elements that you go through to look at the content of the foreign proceeding to assess whether it's in breach of an arbitration agreement. In this case, it could have been a jurisdiction agreement, but it, it, 
I, I hadn't seen those laid out in that that way, and I, I thought that would be you know a good area for us to unpack during this chat, Callum, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I I totally agree. And as I said at the top, this is uh, kind of uh, Mr. Justice Foxton very clearly and succinctly sets out those those three features, and then analyzes the the relief sought in Brazil against them in a way which is which is quite helpful. I did. It did strike me this is a this is a case to earmark for the future where it's basically like a, a textbook chapter on on when an, when an anti suit can be can be used in this kind of situation. Yeah, I had exactly the same thought. I had exactly the same thought, and really the, the, there's three features of the foreign proceedings. So that the proceedings that have been brought in the non contractual forum here, we're talking Brazil, and. It, there's this kind of three features of whether they are or are not seeking security. And that's what we're looking at. We're trying to determine is the local proceedings, proceedings for security in support of London arbitration? That's fine. Or is it going beyond that? Is it doing something that, that goes beyond merely seeking security in support of London? Is it determining something more on the merits? And so there's these three elements that the the judge helpfully sets out. Do you want to run through them, Callum? I've got them here. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll run through them. So, so the first is basically, he talks about the non-contractual court being the court where this application, in this case, Brazil, the court, which is not the, the not the court or, or venue prescribed by the, by the arbitration agreement or jurisdiction agreement. So he says the first factor is that the non-contractual court is not concerned with reaching a final decision on the merits of the claim. So in this situation, the non-contractual court is just taking an interim decision that there's sufficiently arguable merits. And again, there's a parallel there with uh, something like a vessel arrest where the, you know, the local court would say this, this stacks up basically what, you know, the claim that's being, the, the claim that's being brought that underpins this, this vessel arrest application makes good sense. It's a coherent legal argument, but they're not saying we find that the claimant is correct. They're, they're simply saying this looks like a, a claim that has some, some legs. So that's the first one. The second point is that the the relief that they're seeking doesn't involve granting some kind of relief that would normally follow from the final enforcement of the party's substantive kind of argument. So if, if the relief that you're seeking in the foreign court is something that you would be getting at the end of the arbitration process that should be taking place in the in the contractual court, then you're likely you know, you're you're in danger of, of there being an anti suit injunction against you. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, on that one, just before we get on to the third factor, examples uh, and the examples given in this factor are where it requires the payment of a debt to the potative creditor or indeed the, the provision of the disputed contractual performance. So if it actually requires you to do what ultimately you would be seeking to have determined, then that is a feature that takes it beyond merely seeking security on an interim basis. Yeah, exactly. And then if we, again, if we parallel that to something that would maybe be more common, like seeking a local order to discharge cargo into a, into a, into a warehouse somewhere to be held, you know, holding the ring, you would say, well, that's not the order that we're looking for in the arbitration. In the arbitration, we're looking for an order that we're entitled to, to you know, some kind of money, payment of freight or whatever it is. And in the in the non-contractual courts, we're looking for something to hold the ring. Whereas, yeah, so there's that that's the distinction there. And then the third one is that the relief has to be able to be said to be in aid of the substantive proceedings in the agreed forum, and there has to be limited value to seeking the relief unless the proceedings are, are prosecuted through to a, a final award. And again, comparing it to the to the two examples. You know, if you if you seek a vessel arrest, that in itself doesn't help you particularly. You know, obviously there's it, it can be it can be very helpful as we know in in terms of you know move, moving towards settlement for for strategy and you know help you know it helps in many ways to have to have that kind of security. But from a strict black and white legal perspective, having the security in place doesn't give you any better or worse merits in the claim. You still have to proceed with the claim. So the security action is therefore only is only of, of any value if you continue the claim, the, the underlying claim in the, in the agreed forum. Yeah. It requires prosecution to get what you want, right? You can't just sit back and say, okay, we've already got the interim order and we don't need to do anything more. Yeah. So I, I thought it was really clearly laid out by uh, Mr. Justice Foxton. And in this case, the, the judge accepted, I'm not sure, you know, necessarily found that the first factor wasn't a consideration here, but it wasn't, 
it wasn't the one in issue. I think the, the judge, for the benefit of the analysis, accepted the uh, respondent's submissions that the first of those factors, that it was merely an interim decision, was satisfied here. Uh, yeah. But it was, the, it was the second and the third features here that were problematic and why the court ultimately found that this was an order that went beyond the security. And, and so on the second factor, the, the decision in Brazil to grant delivery to the alleged receiver rather than, you know, into a bonded warehouse to the, to the order of the owner, for example, that was effectively granting what the receivers wanted in the final, in, in the final, um, merits pay, uh, dispute. They wanted to get yeah. the cargo. And so the, the local decision was in effect granting the, the relief that they sought. And that then played hand in hand with the third one, because the third one was, third factor was about needing to prosecute the underlying claim to get what you want. Well, here, Mr. Foxen, Mr. Justice Foxen asked the QC for the respondent, well, w what more do the receivers want? What more does the respondent want from the London arbitration that it hasn't already got in the Brazilian court order? And there wasn't really a good answer to that. And that was the, that was the problem on the third one, that the receivers didn't really need to do anything else to prosecute the London arbitration claim to get the relief that they wanted. They had already received that relief in Brazil. And for me, as I said at the outset, the real crux of this or the real problem with the Brazilian court order for me, and there are other features of it as well that were talked about in the decision, but the real one is what we've already talked about on that it granted delivery to the actual receivers. If it allowed delivery into some type of independent body, even if it wasn't necessarily to the custody of the owner, but to someone else who then fell under the jurisdiction of the local court and would be ordered by the local court to follow what the ultimate decision is in London, that would be a different story because it would require the receivers to engage in the London arbitration proceedings and ultimately get a decision in their favor to get delivery of the cargo. But the fact that they didn't have to prosecute. They didn't have to do anything further to get what they actually wanted beyond what was already granted by the Brazilian court meant that it failed on this third, third factor as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and this was, you know, as, as you say, the, 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 Q, the QC for the party seeking to say that this, that there should not, should be no anti-suit just wasn't able to articulate. And indeed it's very hard to see how there could have been any, you know, any, any, any relief that they would actually want to seek in the arbitration itself. If they they they'd got it. They'd won, right? They'd already got what they wanted. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So look, I I I don't think this is a particularly controversial decision in in my view. I, I think it it kind of stacks up with with how I would I would be looking at this. That said, you know, I've said that before, and it's ended up on appeal and and what have you. But I I'd be surprised <laughs> on this one where this is is i think a very useful decision is is the way that it's laid out you're so right that this is <laughs> a decision to come back to uh if you have these types of cases and go through those three those three features of the foreign court proceedings to see to see what they're actually seeking whether that would infringe on the arbitration agreement also thinking about it because you know we, we do this quite a bit where we want to get security in some jurisdiction around the world and different jurisdictions deal with these types of applications differently. I know that's, that's a kind of trite thing to say, but they do. And if you are trying to dance around an arbitration agreement and not impinge on that, I think this decision makes it quite clear what are the questions that we would want to be asking the local lawyer about the nature of the order to make sure that it doesn't impinge on the arbitration agreement, that we are genuinely seeking security. Now, here, I'm under no illusions that the local party may have been seeking to go beyond just merely seeking security. But in other cases, you can see how you, to avoid some criticism or to, to avoid a challenge or an anti-suit in England, when you are genuinely trying to seek security, you could try and draw the limits of what what the local relief is that you've applied for. It's a really good point. You you don't want to be in a position where your security action gets you know the the rug pulled from underneath it because it's somehow you know the subject to an anti suit. So this this is this clearly tells you where that red line is. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a very a very interesting judgment.
and I, I agree with you. It is, I didn't think it was controversial. It wasn't one of the ones where I thought, oh, that, they might have put that one wrong. I thought it's, um, yeah, squarely, squarely as I would have anticipated it, it falling. Yeah. Well, look, thank you everyone for listening in. If you've gotten this far, we, we hope that you've enjoyed the discussion. Anti-suit injunctions are, I think, an interesting part of the law and, and really allows you to examine questions of comity, of deference of one court to another court, respect between them, um, and also when, when, when actions in other jurisdictions need to be curtailed for the primary chosen forum. And, uh, and I find that the jurisdiction battles, if I can call them that, a, a really interesting area of commodities and maritime law and other areas of law as well. But it's, it's almost in its nature, isn't it, the, in these international areas of, of the law to have jurisdiction features uh, and, uh, and arbitration agreements feature such an important part of the overall dispute. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. Good to talk with you, Callum. Looking forward to the next one already. For those of you who are new to Case by Case, and this is your first time listening, Callum, I, uh, you may have picked up, and uh, we don't talk about these cases before we jump on. We each independently read them, make some notes ourselves, and jump on to, onto the podcast and have a chat about it. And this is the, the product that you, you hear. It's a, it's a one-shot recording, and we, we, we enjoy it, and hopefully that you do as well. If, if you have, please do subscribe to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and we're, we're trying to get back into the rhythm of, of weekly podcasts coming out on Thursdays. So we hope you enjoy. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, it's all, it's all organic, one take only. I always enjoy it. It's, it's always good to hear. It's always, it's always fun to knock the ideas around and see, see what you're thinking on these cases. This is one of the, one of the ones probably in the narrow majority where we, where we seem to be pretty ad item. <laughs> exactly. Good one. All right, Cal. Cheers, Luke. See you. Bye.